Шановні друзі, ми розпочинаємо. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Please take your seats. So, folks, take a seat. Take your seats, please. Okay, ready to start. Uh, I want to present you an unbelievable panel of brilliant speakers. And uh, uh, let me present everyone. So, Natalia Cheresko, she is a former Minister of Finance of Ukraine, uh, a student of Ukraine and, and, and real expert of everything that relates to finance and uh, economy. Uh, Stephen Redmaker. Uh, uh, the former senior uh, State Department official, and now he, pre he represents uh, Covington and Bailey. This is one of the biggest uh, uh, law firms, and I, as a prime minister, even hired them uh, in helping Ukraine to fight against uh, uh, Russians in uh, the number of international courts. Uh, an amazing figure, just amazing figure, uh, uh, Larry Summers. Uh, President Emeritus of uh, uh, um, Harvard University and U.S. Treasury Secretary in 1999 and uh, 2001. Uh, Minister, hello. And uh, um, another amazing and astonishing uh, speaker is Philip Zelikov, professor at the University of Virginia, uh, chancellor at the U.S. Uh, Department of State in 2005 and 2007. So here is the thing, what we are to discuss. The previous panel discussed the way how to prevail in this war from the military standpoint. The income at this panel is uh, to, deliber to deliberate over the way how to, to, to sustain this war economically, how to reconstruct Ukraine after the war, what really is Marshall Plan is about, and how to confiscate Russian assets. I can't hear. The Russian assets is to be one of the key resources and sources of Ukraine's yeah, Ukraine recovery plan. Uh, let me present you in brief uh, uh, the current, I would say, picture what's up in the Ukrainian economy. You remember uh, when Marshall presented his Marshall plan, he said <clears throat> the patient is sinking while uh, uh, the doctors are still deliberating. This is the right quote. In Ukrainian uh, circumstances, the patient is still uh, uh, living on the ventilator, but the, uh, the doctors haven't even started real deliberations over how to uh, heal this patient. Uh, so my, my guess is that, look, uh, after the full-fledged invasion, Ukraine lost around 20% of territory right now. So we have around 8 million of uh, IDPs, 6 million of those uh, who fled the country. Uh, uh, mm, uh, Russians heavily bombarded Ukrainian ports, Ukrainian industrial sites, uh, mm, and this severely affects the Ukrainian economy. And uh, mm, uh, last but not least, uh, the Ukrainian inflation is uh, relatively high, and uh, the GDP dropped last year by 40%. This year it's slightly better, mm, but once again, on the one hand, Ukrainian economy is not nose diving, and frankly speaking, Russians neither too which is the problem, even despite this, the, the, the harsh sanctions that have been imposed against Russia. But uh, how to survive and how to build the new Ukraine? This is the topic of this uh, panel discussion. So let me start uh, with uh, Secretary Summers. So Mr. Secretary, do you believe that Ukraine is to get the Marshall Plan? Uh, who is to co-sponsor this Marshall Plan? As we do remember that uh, Americans were the only uh, who actually orchestrated the way how to survive the Western uh, uh, Europe. This time uh, we need to enlarge uh, this community. And whether, yes. it's, and whether it's really possible uh, to finance a recovery and reconstruction or new Marshall Plan with the Russian assets. Let me say that I'm honored to participate in this significant uh, forum, to be here with my friend, Natalie Jaresko, my collaborator, Philip Zelikow, 
and uh, with all of you. And let me say that one broad lesson of history is that it is as important to win the peace always as it is to win the war. None of us are divided on the question of the importance of winning the war and bringing it to a conclusion that assures future peace, security, and stability for Ukraine. And none of us should for a moment suppose that that will be possible without winning the peace. And at the center of winning the peace is establishing an economically strong and viable Ukraine closely linked in its economic interactions with Europe and with and along with Europe with the broader world. The Marshall Plan is an immensely compelling metaphor. It is perhaps the most successful plan the United States has ever formulated in the foreign policy uh, sphere. And it is certainly the case that after the Marshall Plan, the outlook for Western Europe was profoundly different than it was before the Marshall Plan. And that had the Marshall Plan not been conceived and enacted, the history of the period we now call the Cold War quite likely would have been written in very different terms because the war would not have stayed uh, cold. So I applaud all of those who have worked to think about, formulate, and extend the Marshall Plan metaphor uh, to the situation in uh, Ukraine. And I would offer these four observations. First, there is no question that the needs are immense. One can argue about what the infrastructure gap is. One can argue about what the ongoing uh, needs uh, are and are being increased by the ongoing destruction in uh, Ukraine. One can argue about what can be financed from domestic resources and what can be financed uh, globally. One cannot avoid the conclusion that the necessary transfers and infusion of funds from the rest of the world is measured comfortably in the hundreds of billions of dollars. There is no prospect of the kind of success that security requires without the infusion of hundreds of billions of dollars. Second, Resources are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Here are two things about the original Marshall Plan that are not so frequently remarked. The Marshall Plan actually involved less budgetary outlay per year by the United States for Europe, then the United States had been providing in the years between the E-Day and the enactment of the Marshall Plan. 
but substantial transfers infused for humanitarian purposes without an overall strategic conception, without a commitment to trade and payments linkages, without the engagement of the global private sector, were not sufficient to bring about the kind of takeoff that a reconstruction situation of this kind uh, requires. And so we must remember that resources are necessary, but as the pre-Marshall Plan experience in Europe illustrates, they are not sufficient. It is also important to recognize that the world has seen many Marshall plans in quotation marks since the original in Kosovo, in the West Bank, in Bosnia, in places in, Afri uh, in Africa, in East Timor, and I could go on. Most of those Marshall plans, if you measured the sum of resources transferred relative to the size of the economy of the recipient location, were actually substantially larger than the original Marshall plan, but none have been as successful as the Marshall plan. So yes, let us focus on resource transfer, but let us focus even more on international economic linkage, on ongoing economic reform, on strong economic policies of the kind that former finance minister Juresco is an expert in formulating as we think about the vitally important objective of winning the peace in Ukraine. Third, yes, resources can, resources should, and resources, I would argue, must come from the frozen reserves of Russia, and that process must begin as soon as possible. Philip, who you will hear from, I suspect, in a few moments, unlike me, has a law degree and has surveyed in consultation with many other uh, lawyers, the relevant domestic and international law. I am satisfied that with instructions to lawyers to find a way that accomplishing the deployment of reserves for Ukraine would not be one of the 10 most ambitious things that lawyers have accomplished in enabling presidents of the United States or leaders of European nations to meet policy imperatives within the last five years. Fortunately, both precedent and statute recognize the principle of compensation and surely compensation is necessary at this moment. What are the advantages of deploying Russian uh, resources? They are several. The resources are available 
and available in quantity at a time when the risk that we will invest too little dwarfs any risk that we will invest too much. They will, the use of these resources serves to underscore the extraordinary nature of this situation. And it is precisely because the statutes and the rationale are narrow and carefully drafted that they will serve as a deterrent to any nation contemplating the kind of wanton aggression that Russia has committed in this case. And finally, even as we focus on Ukraine today, and even as the attention of the world is riveted on Ukraine, we must remember that the world is literally on fire with climate change, with continuing pandemic threats, with poverty leading to increased uh, governmental breakdown and fragility of states providing bases for terrorism. And if resources that went to Ukraine that needed to go to Ukraine were to come at the expense of broadly globally needed resources, the consequences for the global system and therefore ultimately Ukraine could be catastrophic. And that too is a reason why the use of Russian reserves is essential and something in which stakeholders from all countries should see a strong interest. Indeed, careful consideration should be given to whether a small fraction of those resources are deployed in support of those other nations that have borne the burden of Russian aggression through higher food prices, through refugee burdens, or in other uh, ways. So yes, a Marshall Plan is necessary. Yes, that Marshall Plan needs to be large and measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars. It's so tempting to focus on the numerology, but painful history teaches so wrong. And we must, at the same time we focus on the numerology, also focus on the needs of four structural policies, particularly those that involve the private sector and that link Ukraine and Europe. And yes, there is only one appropriate source for the major funding, and that is the reserves of the Russian uh, state. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. So it's so inspiring to hear the word yes, but not the word no. Uh, so uh, uh, I've got your point, and you just mentioned private investors. And I do believe that uh, Natalie Jurasko, as a finance minister, she is well aware how to handle public finances. Just to remind you that in the times of war, we managed to decrease the budget deficit. In the times of war, we managed to decrease the uh, overall debt of the, of, of the country. In the times of war, we managed to maintain low inflation. So it's a kind of miracle. Now. Absolutely, finance. There, there was no other way to survive, to finance the military. And we increased the budgetary expenditures up to 5% of GDP for the, for the Ukrainian military. But here is the thing. 
Uh, uh, Secretary Summers already mentioned uh, a number of sources and resources uh, to be allocated uh, uh, to help Ukraine to rebuild. But one of the key resources would be, and I want to reiterate once again, would be private investors. I've had plenty of rumors that there is a very long line in Korea of those who want to invest into Ukraine right now. Is it true? And what kind of preconditions have to exist in order to attract these international private investors? Except the memorandums, because I've heard that some memorandums have been signed and uh, everyone is believing in, in the economic miracle. So tell me please, Madam Minister, how to execute this miracle? Thank you very much. And thank you, Secretary Summers, for calling out the reforms. I would say that it's important for us to understand that the private sector does want to be a part of a successful rebuilding of Ukraine, but it will require a variety of conditions. One of the things I would focus on initially is to translate Ukraine's vision of recovery and renewal, which is clear. We want a country that is green. We want a country that is part of the EU. We want a country that is technologically advanced into an actual strategy for renewal. And in that strategy, sequencing of capital is going to be a part of this. I don't think we can expect the private sector to be the first one here. It just will not be the case. They need to see, I believe, the Russian central bank assets being fully utilized, public monies being utilized, then public-private partnerships, and only then the private sector. So blended finance is going to have to come first, which means all of our partners across the globe are going to need to think of ways to bring their private sectors along before their private sector is fully ready to be here on their own. So on the side of our international partners, we need to think very much about creatively working with the private sectors of these countries to bring them here before they are ready to take the risk. And they are not ready to take the risk today. The second part of this strategy that I think we need, which is to go beyond vision, we have a vision, has to do with what's going to be first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the priorities. So we talk about EU accession, but as an investor, I don't know whether today I should be building a manufacturing facility to manufacture to EU building code standards or Ukrainian building code standards. And if it's EU, when is that going to be? So saying that we want to be a part of the EU isn't enough to inform an investor as to how we plan to really adapt this economy to the EU and when they should be a part of it and how they can be a part of it. I think a big part of what investors are going to need to see is something that we don't talk a great deal about right now, which is our own capacity to rebuild and renew. The human capacity. The dem demographics of the situation are horrific. Companies here today, governments, USAID contractors, are scrambling to hire people. With, you said, six million inter internally displaced people, or six million have left, millions have left, what is the strategy of the government to bring these folks home? How do we work to bring them home? What is it that they need to be convinced to come home? What skill sets do they need to help in the recovery and the rebuilding? That plan has to be there because I can't build a manufacturing facility if there's no one here to work in this manufacturing facility. All of the economic reforms and anti-corruption reforms, whether we like it or not, we have unfortunately earned a reputation in the world as a very corrupt country. I will be the first to say I'm originally from Chicago and I've worked in Ukraine 25 years, in Puerto Rico for five years. Corruption is human nature and it exists everywhere. The question is how much? And we need to get the word out. An enormous amount has been done in the last 10 years for prevention. The creation of all kinds of anti-corruption institutions, independent, apolitical, from, the, from NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, to the anti-corruption prosecutors, to the courts. So from a prevention side, we've created institutions. We've also created technological solutions that eliminate the even possibility of corruption. From procurement reform in Prozoro, to e-budget, to decentralizing the funding down to the local government so that society can see how monies are being spent all the way through to the Zenda O process in higher education that now implements testing such that it's not a bribe that determines your students' uh, next steps. Today I was at a hospital in Bula Tsarkva. The entire uh, medical reform that's happened to date 
both the procurement reform in medicine, but also the primary doctor's changes that uh, Minister Suprun implemented, has changed at the ground level how much corruption there is. And I don't think the world understands well enough all of the changes that have been made in this area of prevention. And we need to get that word out. In the, on, the, on the other side, punishment, you know, people want to know that consequences exist. Do you or do you not arrest people who have been charged? I think we're seeing the results of that. I think every day we're seeing people being arrested, people being charged, and people paying the price for corruption. That has to be consistent, it has to be apolitical, it has to be at every level from top down, and we will make our case. And the last piece then is judicial. We have to have confidence in our court system. So we're gonna need to provide that confidence to get private investors here. We're gonna have to show them how our court system has changed. I spent a little bit of time with the Ukrainian Bar Association this weekend. And there are some very specific things that have happened that change what used to be the wild, wild east to where we are today. One example, you used to be able to, as a single shareholder in a joint stock company, not come to a meeting and that meeting would not be valid. You might hold 0.1% of the shares. The Supreme Court of Ukraine has issued instructions that says that basically it's not automatically denying the validity of that meeting. It depends on the effect that that one shareholder might have had. That was a mechanism that people used over and over to deny the ability for corporate governance to continue and join stock companies in Ukraine. That doesn't exist in Ukraine anymore. There's a half a dozen or more changes in the judicial system like that. And then there's another dozen or more that need to happen. So I think for, private, for the private sector to finish, they're gonna need to see the public sector money come first. They're gonna need to see public programs from their governments that bring them in, blended finance. They're gonna need to see a strategy behind Ukraine's vision. And they're gonna need to see the capacity, the human capacity in Ukraine to, to actually implement that vision. We're gonna need to see how the demographics change and explain it. And then finally, we need to fight with every morsel of our existence the both reputation and reality of corruption here through prevention, our court system, and punishment. Well, Madam Secretary, let me add what, one thing, and we need security. We need security guarantees, and we need victory Number one. for the Ukrainian people. Uh, so, my next question goes to Professor Zelikov. Professor, Thanks for being with us. Uh, so, Professor, if, if you mm, study, I mean, if you look into the international media, a plenty of different pundits say, how is it difficult and complicated? And, and practically, uh, uh, mm, there is no chance to uh, confiscate the frozen assets of the Russian Federation. And you with the Secretary Summers and with Bob Zelik, uh, you actually present a completely different picture. And I do really uh, admire and I do really commend your very strong, blunt and righteous stance on this particular issue. And the last article that you published in, in The Economist is a, a clear-cut example of, of this uh, very solid position that you've presented. So tell me the reason what's happening in the world. Why are plenty of folks are so scared to confiscate Russian assets? Um, thanks. The first thing to keep in mind is, although people were aware of the Russian assets issue, they did not, the governments did not really begin seriously working on this issue, I think, until about, oh, three or four months ago. And they have still not devoted a lot of time and attention to how to work the Russian assets problem. They treated the Russian assets issue purely as a matter of sanctions. And under, sanction, under a sanctions approach, you can't take the Russian money. The sanctions approach simply holds the money hostage to persuade Russia to change its policies. Only in the last few months have governments begun to realize that the sanction, uh, sanctions approach has reached a dead end, and they have to now move to a countermeasures approach. Now, we've been arguing that position for a year, more a year and a half, but only recently have governments started realizing that sanctions aren't good enough, and now they must proceed to countermeasures 
in which they take the money in order to save Ukraine. And by the way, they need to take this money to save Ukraine to win the war, not just to win the peace. Um, the Russian strategy in this war is if we can't conquer Ukraine, we will wreck Ukraine. We will make Ukraine a weak state and hope that its politics collapse, uh, which was part of the subject of your previous session. The, the victory strategy is not just on the battlefield. The victory strategy is to show that whatever Russia does, Ukraine will advance, will prosper, and will become part of Europe. The victory strategy requires the kind of resources Secretary Summers referred to and the kind of reforms that former Minister Juresko just mentioned. But only recently have Western governments begun to seriously think about this. Uh, um, they have overwhelmingly devoted their time and energy to all the military issues and to the emergency and humanitarian assistance and budget support problems. If you were to talk to the people in the Western embassies, they, they've been spending 95% of their time just on managing the current flows of emergency assistance, which don't really get into the rebuilding or compensation issues yet at all, which are on this enormous scale and which will keep Ukraine from moving forward. So if you want to, like, why is this so hard? First is everyone has been preoccupied until very recently with other things, to be very blunt about it. Second, it's, um, there were a series of legal issues that confused many people, um, and a number of people got very bad advice uh, early on about how to approach these legal issues because they didn't, they didn't really comprehend what a remarkable and unprecedented situation this is. And they didn't look for far, far enough back to see the precedents that were available and how to handle this. In other words, they stayed entirely in the realm of sanctions and did not step up to the issue of countermeasures. To give you an example, uh, I have seen the European Commission legal paper that they wrote in the spring on this issue. I have read that paper. That paper is not one paragraph of that paper discusses the issues of state countermeasures and the international law of countermeasures. It simply doesn't discuss it. It's entirely done inside the law of the EU sanctions directive, which is a whole different body of law. So the EU just simply didn't examine the countermeasures option. So there's the, uh, a big factor is legal confusion, which we're now trying to dispel. I'm now working with two independent teams of international lawyers to begin answering these legal questions in a really decisive way, beyond the arguments that I and others have already put forward. So one, legal issues. Two, there was a lot of, um, there were a number of bad financial arguments put forward about, oh, well, we can't touch the central bank assets because then people won't put their money into euros. They won't use dollars in foreign exchange. They'll retreat to Chinese renminbi. Uh, Larry Summers and Bob <clears throat> Zellick and I have shown that that's actually a really bad argument, but it's superficially plausible and it appealed to irritated bankers who didn't want to be bothered by these suggestions. So there was a series of kind of hasty and superficial financial arguments made that were not seriously examined, but that were easily accepted if people didn't really take the time to analyze them. Um, so that's the second. Beyond that third, there are political issues. When you get into the state countermeasures issue, people there is a political worry, which they do not articulate publicly, that Russia will retaliate that Russia will retaliate against the remaining economic interests that European countries and Japan still have in Russia. They are right about that. I think Russia will retaliate. The mistake they've made is they've not noticed or don't, they don't know how to deal with the fact that Russia has already begun that retaliation. Russia has already launched a series of countermeasures both against foreign companies and against foreign investors on a very large scale. But the Russians continue to hold many companies and investors hostage, in effect, 
threatening that if you go ahead with countermeasures, we at Russia have already adopted these countermeasures and are prepared to use them against all your foreign private interests. Now, it's illegal for Russia to do this, but they don't care. So underneath the surface, which they don't say in public, there is a fear in a number of countries that Russia will then rapidly liquidate all of their remaining private interests in Russia. And that scares them. And partly because some of these countries have not really recognized that they are in an economic divorce from Russia and have not stepped up to simply accepting and writing down the full costs of that divorce. I think, by the way, all of these issues are going to start being addressed in a much deeper way over the next few months. Um, my main point is mainly folks have not acted on this stuff because they've been preoccupied and have analyzed the issues only superficially. I think they are now going to have to analyze these issues in much greater depth in the next few months. And so I think the period ahead during the remainder of this year and in the winter will be absolutely crucial for mobilizing the effort to address the Russian assets and put them to work and to devise the kind of mechanisms that Secretary Summers was talking about and former Minister Juresko was talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so my, now my question goes uh, uh, to Secretary Redmaker. Uh, so here is the thing I want to discuss here uh, uh, to deliberate over the global order or global disorder. I can't really figure out uh, where we are where we are uh, right now. So Russia committed an act of aggression, right? Right. Russia is to feel the pinch. Russia is to foot the bill. Is, and Russia is to bring to justice, both from the criminal standpoint and financial one. We are well aware that there is a long-standing narrative of an issue of sovereign immunity. My guess that in this particular issue, it's no longer a sovereign immunity. It's a sovereign impunity. And it, 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 it completely, it's a completely different definition. So, uh, 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 Steve, tell me please, whether there is any kind of real legal possibility to confiscate these Russian assets, and who is to be in the driver's seat? Americans? as the leader of the free world, Europeans, as uh, uh, the area where the biggest amount of Russian frozen assets have been allocated, the UN, uh, it's no name in this particular case. So who is to be in the driver's seat and whether it's possible to confiscate? Um, thank you. Th th those are all great questions. Um, l l let me begin by saying it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I was last in Kyiv about 20 years ago. I never dreamed that the next time I came here, I'd have to meet in a bomb shelter. Um, I, I hope that the next time I come here, we don't have to meet in a bomb shelter, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today with you to, to address these questions. Um, I think the, the point you made at the outset is the critical point, which is there's simply no question that under international law, Russia is liable to Ukraine for the incredible damage it's inflicted on this country uh, as a result of its illegal aggression. Um, th th this, is, this is not just a war of aggression, it's actually a war of conquest. Uh, and it, it's completely indefensible under, under international law. The, the, the World Court ruled in February of last year that uh, it, it ordered uh, Russia to suspend uh, its aggression. Uh, Russia has been in defiance of, of that ruling uh, since last February, or February a year ago. Um, you know, any, anybody who wants to rationalize Russia's actions prior to the World Court ruling, uh, you know, I, I don't think they can very well, but after the World Court ruling, there, it's simply unquestionable that, that Russia's been acting in defiance of international law. And uh, the UN General Assembly last uh, November adopted a resolution affirming that, that Russia owes compensation to Ukraine for, for everything it's done. So the, the question isn't whether whether Russia owes Ukraine compensation, it's how is Russia going to pay the compensation that it owes? Uh, we have a, have a precedent from the, the, the last uh, example of, of colossal aggression uh, 
that was when, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Uh, in, that, in that instance, um, Iraq was held financially liable for, for the aggression and, and over a 30-year period paid compensation to those who, who it had injured in Kuwait. Uh, and that, that compensation was paid out of Iraqi oil revenues uh, over the succeeding 30 years. Uh, you know, Russia's a big oil exporter. You know, Russian oil revenue you know, may be a source of compensation uh, in, in coming years. It's, it's certainly something we, we should keep in mind. But uh, more immediately, there, there is the, the roughly $300 billion in, in, in frozen Russian assets. And um, you, you asked um, Professor Zelikow the question, you know, what, what are the obstacles to, uh, to confiscating that money? Um, uh, the first point I'd make is uh, the, the G7 nations have already, as a as policy matter, uh, declared that they're taking that money hostage. They don't intend to return that money to Russia until the compensation issue is resolved. How it will be resolved, given Russia's uh, veto power at the UN Security Council, is an open question. Uh, but obviously, um, taking the next step and not just holding that money hostage, but actually making it available for for the reconstruction of Ukraine and, and to provide compensation to, to claimants in Ukraine, uh, would be a, a very logical step. And what are the obstacles to that? Well, as, as Professor Zelikow outlined, uh, really, I think I think it's two principal problems. One is financial sector concerns about you know, the, the effect on global investment. Uh, will, will countries like China start pulling their money out of currencies where, where Russian assets were, were confiscated? I, I don't profess to be an expert on that. Um, uh, Secretary Summers is an expert on that. I, uh, uh, Bob Zelika, or I'm sorry, uh, Bob Zelik, uh, the former World Bank president, is also an expert. They, they've opined that, that this is a, an overblown concern, but I, I, I don't want to uh, um, make their arguments for them. The, the other concern is about international law. And um, uh, as, as uh, Phil Zelico said, I think a lot of the analysis that, that has been brought to bear up until now has been very shallow. Uh, the, there is, in fact, a, a very compelling uh, legal rationale, the countermeasures rationale, um, that um, without very much creativity can, can be used to justify confiscating the, the Russian assets and making them available. Um, the, the superficial analysis that we've seen, uh, you know, some experts have looked and said, well, you know, countermeasures, is, is, it's, it's the principle under international law that um, a country can defy or, or ignore its, its international legal obligations if the object of doing that is to compel another country to comply with its international obligations. So um, you mentioned sovereign immunity. That, I mean, today Russian assets, uh, the $300 billion, uh, enjoy sovereign immunity. But we could take that sovereign immunity away as a countermeasure and allow claimants access to that money. Um, as a countermeasure designed to compel Russia to come back into compliance with its international legal obligations. And, and it's worth remembering what those international legal, legal obligations are. First, they need to end their illegal aggression. But secondly, uh, they need to provide compensation. The, 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 Russia has both of those international legal obligations. Until it's performed both of those, uh, or complied with both of those obligations, the countermeasures theory is available to justify confiscating the, the Russian assets. Um, the, you know, one of the concerns that's expressed is, well, in theory, countermeasures are supposed to be reversible. Uh, if, if the target of the countermeasures finally comes into compliance with its obligations. We've analyzed this uh, at my law firm. There, there's, we have a legal opinion on this, which I think copies are available at the back if, if you want to take one home with you. Um, the, the conclusion we came to is it's very easy to make countermeasures reversible. Um, the, the World Bank has, uh, the World Bank estimated in February of this year that um, uh, to date, uh, that is until February, uh, Russia had inflicted $411 billion worth of damage on Ukraine. That, that number has obviously grown since last February. Um, in theory, what Russia needs to do is write a check to Ukraine for at least $411 billion plus some more. Um, in theory, if Russia did that and came back into compliance with its obligations, um, the countermeasures should be reversible, and it, we, we don't think it would be hard to make them reversible. I mean, if, if in theory, Russia wrote that check to Ukraine, uh, 
the, the, the assets provided uh, in the meantime out of the Russian, or the money provided in the meantime out of the, the frozen Russian assets uh, could be, uh, Ukraine could be obliged to return that money in the event that it receives compensation in the same amount from Russia. Now, of course, that's never going to happen, but th there's the theoretical answer to the reversibility problem. And um, it's not, not some, as, lo as long as the, the provision of this money to Russia was properly structured, there would not be a problem. Um, I, I did want to answer your final question, which was uh, who would take the lead on this? You know, interestingly, uh, for all the, the hand-wringing among international lawyers, Canada has taken the lead. Uh, Canada has already enacted legislation uh, to, to provide authority uh, to its government to vest Russian assets in, in, in Canada. Um, legislation is now pending in the United States Congress to do the same uh, in America. Um, and ultimately, we, I think it's important. Most of the money is actually in Europe. So ultimately, we, we want Europe to, to take the same step. But I, I, I think the, the first step is for America to follow Canada's lead. And then uh, should America take that step, then, then we need uh, Europe to follow the lead of Canada and the United States. So thank you, Steve. As far as I understand, there is a brilliant solution. Let's reallocate all assets that have been in the EU to Canada. And in this way, Canadians can easily liquidate and, and seize them. Got it works it. for me. <laughs> uh, uh, my message, if I may, if I may just deliver the message to our distinguished uh, uh, panelists. Uh, look, here is the thing. I don't believe in any kind of diplomatic solution between Ukraine and Russia. I don't trust that at any circumstances, Putin or his successor will decide to repay the damages that have been inflicted on Ukraine. So it means that we need to elaborate an international mechanism, a legally binding international uh, mechanism, how to bring to justice Russia, how to make them pay, and how to put into the prison cell these Russian culprits. This, this is my message, and uh, uh, that's my take. Uh, but I have the question to uh, distinguish uh, uh, Secretary Summers. Uh, uh, as uh, Professor Zelikov uh, already said, that there is a superficial, plausible explanation. And it goes uh, uh, without saying that some folks say that, look, if we confiscate, for example, Russian assets that have that are denominated in U.S. dollars or euros, uh, this will pave the way for, I don't know, Chinese, uh, uh, Turkish leaders or, or BRICS leaders to retreat from dollar-denominated assets to renminbi or something else. Do you believe this is a plausible argument or no? I believe that any incremental effect of what we do here on the demand for dollars or the foreign exchange value of the dollar will be trivial compared to the fluctuations that are taking place. I do believe that it is important that the G7 act in concert here. If it were ever to be the case that a radically different perspective was taken with respect to dollar assets and to euro assets, I could imagine that it might bring about a change in the relative value of dollar and euro assets. That's why it seems to me all the serious thinking in this area involves collective actions by the uh, international uh, community. And that's why there is an important role uh, for, uh, dipl uh, for diplomacy. Let me just make a couple of points. Uh, first, what we're talking about is seizing Russia's dollar assets. If Russia were to seize our ruble assets, that would be a blow that, to put it mildly, we could uh, withstand. Second, um, where is someone who is nervous 
going to put their money into our central banks, going to hold reserves in uh, crypto? How widely is it likely that rubles or renminbi will be accepted as a payment? Even if there were to be some transfer of uh, demand, how consequential really would that exorbitant privilege be? It is not that nations that don't function as reserve currencies pay that large a premium uh, in interest rates. But last, um, I think I'm most important. I think of myself as a realist. I am not um, overly optimistic about the collectivity of uh, nations, about the role of warm feeling as shaping international reality. But let us suppose that a firm precedent is established that wanton regulate, wanton aggression in clear and absolute violation of international law will be met with sanctions. How many are there who are planning to engage in such aggression and who would want to signal that aggression by stepping up and changing their uh, currency holding practices. I do not doubt that the BRICS as a collective are desirous of moving to a less dollar-centered international system. I do not doubt that to whatever extent they can, which I think will prove rather limited, they would like to increase the share of international trade, particularly in commodities, that is invoiced in currencies other than the dollar. But that is something they are seeking to maximize right now. The question is not, can we avoid any question for the dollar and the euro here? The question is, what if any incremental impact would this change have? No one supposes that right now, these assets are going back to Russia. It has already happened. The Russian Central Bank, because it was holding its assets, its reserve assets in dollars abroad, has lost those assets. That has already happened with all of the associated financial consequences. I think relatively limited financial uh, consequences. But whatever, it has already happened. If we show our weakness, and do we doubt for one second that if in some way the roles were reversed, what Russia or China would do, if we, instead of deploying those assets, allow them to be denied to the Russians, but sterile and frozen? Do we somehow think that will make our currency or our economy stronger? I do not believe it. This is um, what is called a make-weight argument. It is an argument made by those who are uncomfortable with 
deviating uh, from uh, tradition, who know what they think and are trying to figure out why. It is not a major and a serious, uh, consi- uh, serious uh, consideration. And I do not believe for one second that there is any important risk to uh, moving on uh, this proposal. I am, as I hope I have made clear, very strongly in favor of what is under discussion here. But if you ask me what I'm worried about, it is not this set of issues at all. It is much more that the resources will be deployed and not well used and uh, that opportunities will therefore be lost. That financial uh, transfers will be seen as a substitute for meaningful economic uh, integration. These, it seems to me, are uh, substantial uh, risks. But the risk that this uh, act is going to seem to anyone other than a natural continuation of the policy path that we have set of responding firmly to Russia seems to me to be utterly bizarre. Well, I I fully share your take. And uh, they've started this process of so-called de-dollarization a decade ago. And no doubt that uh, not only Chinese, but Chinese, they are actually the flagship of this process, will try to weaponize the currency. And it's a part of uh, uh, geopolitical standoff. It's crystal clear. And on the other hand, look, this is the challenge for all of us. And this challenge can make us stronger in case if we find an appropriate response. And this response, the response is on the table. So what is needed, a strong political will is needed, guts, in everything, including this particular case. Uh, uh, so we have another three minutes and just uh, 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 for each participant, one question. So Professor Zelikov, tell me please, whether Ukraine can rely on bipartisan support in the US and EU unity in the European Union uh, uh, relatively to a long-lasting financial support of Ukrainian economy and of Ukrainian fight against uh, the Russians. What's your take? Yeah, my take is uh, um, you should not rel- Ukraine should not count on it. Ukraine should call for it and push for it. Um, but I think the uh, bipartisan base is shaky. Um, I could go into a lot of details about what will happen on the supplemental funding issues. And there are a lot of people right now who are counting the votes. Without going into a lot of detail about it, I'll just tell you that it's it's going to be a close call. And that's, uh, we're talking about debates in the next month or two. When you then carry that forward into next year, I think the situation doesn't get easier. I think it will get harder. I think this is also true in European publics. They're going to be under a tremendous budget constraints in the European Union. Um, all the issues having to do with Ukrainian accession are very, very costly. And they have not identified where to get the money. And so there's a, so the, the strategy then is don't put together a strategy that relies on wide bipartisan majorities continuing to give money to Ukraine just like they did last year. Don't count on that. Therefore, develop a strategy that does not count on that. And that's one of the reasons why the Russian assets issue is so urgent. Thank you. Uh, 
You're going to be the last one. Uh, so, uh, uh, Secretary Redmaker, tell me please, what the Ukrainian government has to do to spare the efforts to confiscate the Russian assets? What, 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 what kind of U Ukrainian contribution could be in order to make this process viable? What needs so, to be done? So, the, uh, as uh, Professor Zelko said, I, I, I do think this question is getting a lot more attention now than it did six months or a year ago. And a major reason that's true in Washington is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, legislation has been introduced in the U.S. Congress uh, to provide the legal authority to, to confiscate the Russian assets. Uh, currently, uh, the consensus among Washington lawyers is that, that the president doesn't have the authority to do it. So this legislation would give the president authority to do that. You know, we, we have the, the great fortune in America that we're not a parliamentary system. So the, the role of our legislature is not to support the government's program, to cast votes in favor of what the government wants. So the role of our legislature is to leaven the system, to, to, to stimulate discussion. And that's precisely what um, members of Congress are doing in sponsoring this legislation. Now, th this is not an initiative of the Biden administration. I, I mean, I think, frankly, the Biden administration would prefer not to be bothered with this issue. They've got other things on their mind. Uh, it is true there, there are questions about the, the degree of bipartisan support for additional funding for Ukraine. And, and when, we, when we talk about that, I think what most people are talking about is, you know, are all the conservative Republicans in the Congress going to support more money for Ukraine? But I, I do think it's important to, to, to state for the record, this legislation that I'm talking about in Congress is, in both the House and Senate is sponsored by the Republicans. Okay, it's the Republicans in Congress that are urging the Biden administration to consider this issue. And, um, you know, so <laughs> and we'll see whether the Democrats in Congress actually uh, rally in support of it or not. Um, and I think maybe what they do will depend in part on signals they receive from the Biden administration. But I, I think, you know, what can Ukraine do? I, I think Ukraine needs to make crystal clear that this is a priority. Uh, this is a priority to your government, uh, something that uh, maybe is not as immediately as important as continued military assistance, but. You know, it's about the future of your country. And, uh, uh, you know, the Republicans that are pushing this legislation will be deeply grateful for those kinds of signals because it will help them uh, in advancing this idea with the Biden administration. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, last is not least, you know, and you are one of the most important person. So tell me, please, frankly, do you believe in the Marshall Plan for Ukraine? And who is to spearhead this process? Uh, so Marshall was the U.S. general, right? Whose name would be labeled a new Marshall Plan? So I think a Marshall-like plan is possible for Ukraine. I don't think it should carry the name of any individual, um, especially any individual outside of Ukraine. I think it needs to be the Ukrainian Renewal Plan. It needs to be named after the people of Ukraine the, the nation of Ukraine, the people who have put their lives forward to maintain the system of international law, norms, democracy, global peace. And so I think we should not name it after anyone um, individually, but only after the Ukrainian people. I, I do believe that it needs to be a plan that brings together the European Union and the United States and the broader members even of the G20. I do not believe this should be a European or EU plan alone. I have to be frank. I mean, I have an American background. So American technology, American innovation, American capital, American support is important. We cannot rely solely on the European Union. But so is Japanese support, and so is Canadian. And so I would not relegate this to be a European plan. With all due respect, the Europeans need to be front and center, cardinally involved. But I believe this needs to be a plan that brings together, which I think the multi-donor coordination platform today does. The European Union, the United States, Ukraine as co-chairs, and then the other members of the international community are there as well. All of the G7, hopefully we go beyond the G7, we bring in members of the G20, all of the international financial institutions. But again, I think it's now in Ukraine's hands to take this from vision to strategy and to provide the confidence of the reforms that will go with the strategy to bring everyone along to start actually funding this above and beyond what's being funded today for the budgetary support, which is critical, and above and beyond the immediate recovery 
the bridges that the Agency for Reconstruction is renewing and the roads, all of that has to happen. But for the longer term renewal of Ukraine, we have to go from vision to strategy. And that strategy has to include specific reforms, timing, prioritization, and sequencing. So a lot of this is on Ukraine. So Can thank you, something? everyone. Hey, yeah, yes, Secretary. Just... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Secretary Summers, go ahead. I agree with everything that has been said I agree with what uh, Natalie said about many nations needing to be involved. But long years involved with the international system do teach me of the special role of the United States and its president. History will judge the United States and President Biden on how they respond to this global moment. This is an issue that is more consequential financially in terms of hundreds of billions of dollars, more consequential in security terms in terms of standing up to aggression, more necessary in terms of domestic political uh, values, where why should American taxpayers suffering from high costs of living be asked to pay for what could be paid for from sterile Russian reserves and more consequential geopolitically in terms of enabling a broad global effort to support the global system at a time when it is most threatened than any time since the end of the Cold War. History will either see strong movement on this issue as a visionary and transformative act approaching that of the Marshall Plan, or they will see an opportunity lost in the way that an opportunity was lost at the end of the First World War to build a more satisfactory global order. If the United States regards this as an essential priority, it will, in my judgment, happen. If the United States treats it in any other way and as a matter for the workings of collective diplomacy, there will be drift and dither. And so much beginning at the G20 this week will depend upon the choices made by the president and his most senior advisors. Thank you. So 